So, Namaskar, good evening to all of you. Uh, so, we are continuing the topic, the science of yoga. We have already had two talks uh, on this, two lessons, two classes, not talks. So, the third is today. And today I propose to take up the subject. Afterwards, we'll put all these things together in one sequence. Now, I want you to do what you call fuzzy logic. Little bit here, little bit there, a little bit. And then we'll put it together. Because the study of yoga and Upanishads is like that. It's not just linear, straight. You know what I mean. And then we'll put them all, link them together in a linear manner. So, you'll get what's going on. So... Today there is one subject which is very popular, very well known. The word is well known with most people, especially those who are interested in yoga. And that is pranayama. Everybody knows, many, most people say pranayama. It's usually uh, misunderstood as breathing exercises. Not totally misunderstood, but somewhere along then people think pranayama is only breathing in and out. So, what is pranayam? So, for this, we need to split the word into its two syllables, prana and yama. Huh? Prana and yama. Now, yama means rules and regulations. Yama. Yama and yama. Yama means what are the principles and rules followed in the study of prana which means the life energy usually there is a misunderstanding that prana is breath yes it is intimately connected to the breath there is no question about that however prana in the larger context is what the yogi is trying to access and here prana means in fact the one of the oldest Upanishads asked this question. Yet prane na praniti yana prana praniyate. That means what is the first impulse of life that has taken place here? Where does that first impulse of movement, of life, of growth, of being, of birth come from? Prane na praniti. So that prana means that which is alive and which is life, and therefore it means life force. Right. So the theory which Sankhya and Yoga Darsanas both follow is that this whole universe that we have today, there have been so many times when this universe has come and gone. This is also, phys physicists would also tell you that universes exist and then they disappear and new ones come about. Now, the word used in the ancient Hindu Shastras for the dissolution of what is, is Pralaya. So, there is one Kalpa, full Kalpa, or there are many Yogas form one Kalpa, and then after the end of the Kalpa, there is dissolution. Everything is gone. And then the new life comes about. Now, new life comes about. Now, there, are two, there is one very beautiful description. It's very figurative, of course. It's not real. You may think it's real, but it's very figurative. Interesting. That the creator, Brahma, if you conceive of a creator, when he breathes out, one universe is created. And then when he breathes in, it's all dissolved. Dissolution. It simply shows the periodic coming and going of the universe. It doesn't mean that there is one Brahma sitting there and breathing out or breathing in. Uh, it simply means periodically there is create. I wouldn't even call it creation. Why? I will explain. There's creation and then there is dissolution. There, again, there is creation. Now, why I am not using the word creation is because it is not actually creating something new. It is a manifestation, rather, of energy. Now, that energy, that material in some total, altogether, when there is dissolution, when nothing is differentiated, when everything is almost uniform, 
before the movement starts, that material, the primeval material, is called by the Sankhyas as Akasha. Now, when you say normally Akasha, you think of the sky. Why? Because the sky looks empty. There's no differentiation out there. I'm talking about a cloudless sky. Mm. Akasha. And also, when you see from far, it looks blue. But when you go closer, there is no color to it. It's colorless. Which means undifferentiated matter in its primeval original state is called Akasha. Now, all other elements, according to the Sankhyas, are Akasha changing its uh, rates of vibration slightly. This balance. When there is complete balance, there is pure Akasha. There is no movement, there is nothing. This is what is just after the dissolution. And then slowly the Akasha begins to differentiate itself because it has an innate intelligence in itself. It's not as if somebody is doing it. I'm talking about Sankhya. It expands. And when it expands, there is movement. And that movement is the primeval prana, the first moment of life. And when this moves, this Akasha, which looks uniform, changes into different elements according to the frequency of their vibrations. Now, this is, this is understood today better than it was understood some years ago because today people are studying quantum physics. They know that everything that is in this earth is it vibrating or moving in a different frequency. Frequency is the word used. If the frequency was uniform, it would be Akasha. When the frequencies change, then it becomes from gross material to subtle material to more gross, subtle and so on and so forth. Let's say uh, Prakriti, this earth that we have, which is usually represented by a square. Actually, it's not a square, it's a cube. In two dimensionally, it's a square, but it's actually a three dimensional object, the cube. Prakriti is represented by this perfect 90 degree corner structure, material. Sankhya say that this material, physical material, which you can touch and feel and so on in different forms. Again, depending on the frequencies, it can take different forms. This is the grossest manifestation of prana or the grossest modification of akasha by prana or through prana. So therefore, even if you find things different, wood, iron, magnetism, electricity, all the energies that we have, plus all the materials that we see or we know, basically they are diff the same Akasha vibrating in different frequencies. Now, if you ask me, this looks quite, if you go into quantum physics, you'll see that even the smallest brick of this whole universe is almost an invisible thing that is moving at a certain frequency. But we see it as solid. Our eyes are adapted only to that. We don't see beyond a certain frequency. We cannot feel beyond a certain because we are in the gross level right now, which means in the level of Prakriti. So, Akasha in its grossest form is Prakriti. And Akasha is, after all, a manifestation of the original life energy called Prana. This is this prana that works on akasha and creates different frequencies. So we have magnetism is one frequency, electricity is one frequency, which means what? That at some point they can all be gathered into one center from which they all come. One uniform frequency from where different frequencies appear. That uniform frequency 
which appears in different forms and different frequencies in the world as well as in the human body is called prana. And it is not an unintelligent force. It has its own innate intelligence, not like our brain intelligence, but something more than that. I tell you, if we think that consciousness is limited to the brain, look at a tree. Tree, I don't know if it will recognize itself, but it certainly has the innate intelligence to guide its roots to go towards water wherever water is available. But you don't see a particular brain structure in a tree. Every cell has its own brain out there, tiny little brain, let's say, the nucleus from which it operates. And when there is no sun available, you'll see the branches growing this way. Nobody tells it to grow, it's built in intelligence. So here, consciousness or intelligence does not require the presence of a physical brain. I'm talking about trees and such things. We think that consciousness has to be associated with the brain because we are accustomed only to that. We think we take our own decisions. Partly true, partly not true, but much of it depends on circumstances also. <clears throat> so this is prana. The life energy, the primeval life energy, which changing the frequencies of akasha makes it into earth that means solid water which means liquid water doesn't mean just water fire which is combustion uh, vayu which is air or wind vapor solid liquid and then heat and then vapor subtle and then beyond is the original Akasha from which all these have descended. Now the yogi says that the way to touch the primeval prana, which is responsible for this whole universe, you cannot touch it in the outside world. You can. Scientists who have managed to touch one part of prana are those who found out about electricity and got us all these lights and all the things that happen with electricity externally. That's also prana from the point of view of Sankhya, that is original prana from which everything springs. However, we have one advantage, human beings, that is we are aware and we can recognize our consciousness. Therefore, we are aware that we also have this prana in us. The yogi says, the Sankhya yogi as well as the one who follows the yoga darsana says that this prana in some form is also in the human body. And luckily for us, I don't know luckily or it is made that way, this prana or life energy which controls the entire universe works in us as the breath. So what is this yogi trying to say? That if you know how to understand the secrets of breath, you understand the secrets of the universe. If you are able to lift your breath from the gross to the subtle and subtler levels, then you are able to understand the prana that operates the entire universe. You are linked to that because after all you are part of that. Now how is it limited, linked to breath? Now let's come to the practical thing called breath. We all breathe. The moment it stops, we are dead. Right? It's such a key nourishment of our system is breath. You can fast for some time without food, you will be alive. Maybe if you fast too much, your thinking will become bad because the brain ceases to function in its optimum level if you starve the body. But you can exist. Without water also, you can exist for some time. Without breath, you cannot exist for more than a minute or so. You, we can try. You, you want, then you want to bust out into a breathing, inhaling. 
So, it is a key factor and there is something very peculiar about breath which is not so with circulation of blood or digestion. We do not voluntarily circulate the blood, we do not. The blood circulates, that would have been nice. Then you can raise or lower your blood pressure yourself, not possible. Circulation happens unconsciously. We say unconsciously because we are not conscious of what operates the circulation. <laughs> okay. And then uh, digestion. What do we do actually? We chew the food. Okay. And then we swallow it. Okay. Even if you have to swallow it, there is a movement in the esophagus. It's called peristalsis. If the muscles of your esophagus have failed, you cannot even swallow the food. You can only put it in your mouth and chew it. Okay, forget it. Suppose they are all working, normal. You have swallowed the food. That's all you can do. What about the digestion? Do we do it consciously? We like to think that we are totally in control of our body. Are we? What happens to digestion? The food goes, other things take over. There are innumerable bacteria in your intestine tracts, intestinal tracts that take up the digestion of food. Chemical processes are going on and the essential requirement that is there in the food is taken and then the blood circulation starts. The heart begins to circulate the blood. So, who is doing it? We are not doing it. Consciously, we are not doing it. It is happening. Although we like to think that all our lives we are doing consciously everything, these things we can put food in your mouth beyond that you have no control, everything is happening. Even in your sleep when you are not aware of the world, external world, circulation is continuing, something is operating it. You can say the brain, whatever, unconscious mind is operating it. Ah, then. What is not required in the body, what happens? Do we decide what should go out and what should not? No. There is an innate system in the body that takes out what is not required, excretion. And the blood that is oxidized is collected and deoxidized and brought back to the system by the heart, controlled by the brain or the vagus nerve, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. We have no conscious part in this. Right? Now, here is one function in our system which is generally run by the unconscious mind, but we can also consciously control breath. From the time we are born till the time we die, we don't ask the lungs to breathe, it goes on. When it stops, we try many things. If nothing works, then you let go. That's all. So, the breathing is not controlled by us. It goes on from the fetus and the, when the baby comes out from the womb, it starts breathing the air. The cry that you hear is actually the bursting forth of air into the lungs. And then it goes on till you die. Right? Not controlled by us. And yet, that is one function we can also control and say, okay, let us breathe consciously. You can't say that about circulation of blood or digestion. Breath, yes. So, this breath, therefore, which is an Im most important part of our being, can also be controlled by us so that we can change its pattern and its rhythm and so on consciously. And this breath is the physical part of the life energy called prana. And just like when you, the, I gave you an illustration that the creator breathes in and the universe is gone and he breathes out and in, in the same way, the human being can give complete attention to his breathing process and breathe in and out and change its rhythms and patterns and therefore change 
not only your body, bodily functions, but also your mind functions and beyond that. Give you an example. But remember, one need not always consciously breathe. If one had to give complete attention to the breath all the time, we would have died long ago because we can't. It's going on by itself. And yet we can sit down and say, okay, now I'm going to give my attention to my breath. That's one function which is both voluntary and involuntary. And that breath is a full connection, complete connection to the great breath, which is the universe, the prana in the universe. Therefore, the yogi who has got control of his own breath can theoretically control the universe. You think this is far-fetched? Yeah, but why do you think yogis can do things which others cannot do? At least to some extent. Now, this life force, which is in our lungs, as oxygen coming in and carbon dioxide going out, is also prana in small letters. And pranayama is the science of how to change or control the rhythms of the breath so that you can then directly get in touch with the universal prana. This is pranayama. What are the rules and regulations and how we go about it? Okay, now... Has prana anything to do with our state of mind? Very much. When I'm saying prana here, referring to the breath, not to the universal prana, to the breath. Uh, have you ever watched your mind when you're agitated? I'm sorry, watched your breath when you're agitated? Watch. Sometimes when you're really agitated, angry and so on, watch your breath you will see that the pattern of your breathing is very erratic. It will be fast breathing, erratic breath. However, if you are, for instance, sitting on a beautiful day outside under a tree and watching the moon or something, or listening to beautiful music, depends on what music you like. Not the music that wants to make you jump. I'm saying music that wants, that makes you quiet and calm then watch your breath. The rhythm of your breathing will be very slow, very, very smooth, very slight, very slow. So the rishis who are scientists in this field, in the internal field, said that if the moods can influence the breath, perhaps the breath can influence the mood. So from there came this complete understanding that with different changes of rhythmic patterns of the breath which can be voluntarily done through the science of pranayama, one can bring about changes in the mind. One can bring about changes in the state of mind and then also go beyond the ordinary mind using this control of the rhythm or the pattern of breathing and from that were devised the different forms of pranayama. So, we'll come to this again. Now, here is something I want to tell you. Even ordinary breathing, actually we have forgotten the art of breathing. All of us do shallow breathing, you know, like this. Only here. There is no deep breathing. And if you just deep breathe, even without doing any other spiritual exercise, see, deep breath, exhale, especially if your hand is held up, then this whole place opens up your lungs. So when you say, now what is happening? Proper irrigation of the breathing system, the lungs. All through this COVID pandemic, I have been teaching this breathing lessons to as many people as possible, including some sessions with WHO in Geneva, where I said, please, if you can only breathe properly, 
you can be saved from much of the havoc cost i didn't i am not saying you can prevent it but you can you can prevent much of the havoc caused by the virus especially the delta virus which attacks you directly into the lungs mm the cavities will come filled up if you know proper breathing proper irrigation with breath then you can actually even physically do better things than not no that is physical about the mind i just discussed by changing the rhythm of breath you can change your moods you can change your mind you can also bring about concentration and attention which is important in the practice of yoga okay now <coughs> how does this work in the practicing yogi uh before that let me say one more thing um our life span unless you had an accident and passed away that's you, nobody has any control over that but our life span is controlled by the number of breaths that we take you may think that this is funny how is this possible uh look at all the animals that live long the whale have you do, i'm sure you know that the whale is not a fish actually it's a mammal shaped like a fish for all purposes it has no gills it doesn't breathe through the water oxygen in the water so it has to come out and then it you you know when a whale is out in the sea because you see a spray of water going up fountain of water which means it's breathing out exhaling and then it takes a deep breath from the air and then goes inside how long does a whale live 120 years or so why because it's breathing <laughs> its breathing rhythm is very low okay elephant the big tortoise that lives for 100 years look at the little creatures cockroaches poor little mosquitoes in one minute they might be taking 100 breaths also 50 breaths we are somewhere in the middle our breathing pattern is somewhere in the middle yogi says also by reducing the rhythm of your breathing your longevity can be expanded in fact the yogi judges one's life span through the number of breaths if you have breathed this much that means it's time to go mm, already so this is this great science of pranayam and there are so many techniques of how to control the prana through your breath okay now we come to a subject which is very much related to this uh, pranayam i'm sure you all know if you are neurology students you definitely know but i don't know that the brain human brain has a left brain and a right brain the two lobes put together by something called the corpus callosum which brings it together now it's a well known fact that certain actions and thoughts and movements are done better when the left brain is at its optimum and certain actions and certain uh thoughts and certain processes are done better when the right brain is working optimum of course they work together but even if they work to one is less and one is more so some people are called left brained and some are called right brained now the right brain is supposed to be the center of intuition uh anything that is to do with that which is strictly out of what so called logic uh, the, from the right brain's point of view 4 plus 4 may be 10 may not be you know we had a movie called do or do pants similar as the left brain is that which accurately calculates everything that's the brain which a banker needs this 
but luckily we all have both <laughs> so it kind of cooperates and balances itself now the yogi says that there are methods and techniques including pranayam by which the activity of the left brain and the right brain can be made voluntary instead of involuntary as it always is so imagine the tremendous capacities that can be developed if one knows how to at one given point make the right brain for instance work better than the left so when you see some yogis who have certain capacities oh he is superhuman he nothing there is no uh, superhuman thing in yoga everything is scientific but since we don't know the explanation we tend to call it superhuman super there is no supernatural it's only that certain laws are not known to normally to human beings so when they see that operate they think it is supernatural the laws can be studied and understood one of the things is the science of pranayama in yoga ha huh? so now there is something that you should like last time i said you should take up uh, one of the textbooks for this course would be swami vivekananda's raj yoga i think i told you it's available anywhere if you go to panchkuy road ramkrishna mission has a bookshop in delhi or you can get it now in amazon nobody goes anywhere nowadays everybody sits at home we have all become yogis everything comes to our house okay so order raj yoga by swami vivekananda where a good discussion on prana and so on is beautifully and simply and especially because he was teaching the westerners who had no idea what he's talking about so he went about it in a beautiful way mm. um however today i want to tell you that those who are doing this course with me this this these classes should also additionally take up the study of another book if you get time and if it is possible and if you can get it and this is called um my stroke of insight by a lady called jill bolt an insight happened an insight i n s i g h t happened to her by mistake by by accident and she discovered something extraordinary and what happened to her was she was herself a neuropathologist this lady so she could kind of place what was going on till the last moment she actually had a hemorrhage of the brain and the uh, blood vessels in the left brain burst it happens sometimes to some people some people are more susceptible to it some are not and if you don't take timely action that is it's over or you will be a paralyzed human being on one side so her left brain had a hemorrhage and it stopped working totally shut off luckily the hemorrhage was only on the left side and just before she was out of action please understand it is the left brain that was blocked because of the hemorrhage all her practical faculties were out see this is the left brain that calculates now i'm getting a stroke i must call the doctor i must use the telephone let's god just before they completely vanish she managed to call the emergency and then that's all after that nothing worked now what happened she noticed that she was saved from death because you know an ambulance is called it immediately comes in some places thank god so she was taken home take it to the hospital and she revived now till that happened only the right brain was working left was completely gone she read this book it's very interesting especially because she herself is a neurologist the right brain was working and she noticed something interesting she was not panicking she was not doing she was actually in bliss because 
You see, it's the left brain that decides our parameters, physical parameters. Like I'm sitting here. So therefore, my physical reach is only up to where my body is. I cannot say I'm sitting there. Right? So, this is because it's the left brain that decides all this. What are my parameters? Where am I sitting? How far am I? Which is my body's limitations. When the left head completely ceased and only the right was working, the intuitive brain, she suddenly found that her concept of space and distance had vanished totally. Instead, she thought, she felt that when the wind was blowing and the plants were moving, she was moving with the plant. That her idea of being confined to Jill Ball's little body disappeared for the time being because the left brain was not working. I'm not saying we should also have a hemorrhage. That's not, <laughs> this is just an example. So, what she found was that her idea of space, limitation, everything vanished for some time. When the wind blew, she was blowing with the wind. When the bird sat on a tree and sang, she, she was singing as the bird. For a second, she got a glimpse because of her hemorrhage of this great idea which the Upanishad says that you are here, there and everywhere. Well, it happened because of a hemorrhage. So, I'm not saying yoga is a way of creating hemorrhages. No, no, no. I'm just giving you an example. So, I think you should get this book and read it. It's worth reading. Because she goes into the different understanding of the right brain, left brain, because she's herself a neurologist. So, it's beautiful. Now, the yogis say, in the science of breath, which is not usually discussed, but I'm discussing with you, it's time we open up these all these mysteries and make it put some daylight into these things. We don't want to selfishly hide these things. That creates more trouble and more problems because some half-baked person says something and everybody believes it. <coughs> Let's open it up. According to yogic theory, now let me ask you something. Do you think that all the time you and I breathe equally through both the nostrils? We might think so, but actually it's not so. This is the secret of, it's called the Swara Shastra, the secret of, of breathing. If you want to find out, take your cell phone, clean it up nicely, put it on, don't do anything now, put it under your nostrils and blow. Invariably, except in some times, you will find that there is a bigger blob of vapor on one side than the other. Other also may be there unless you have a bad cold. Other also, but one will be definitely bigger than the other most of the time. Sometimes it changes. Both are equal. But most of the time. So therefore, the yogis say that the breath works through what they call the ida, the left nadi channel and the pingala, which is the right channel, unequally. And according to the Yoga Shastra, every 36 and a half minutes, the right one becomes more powerful than the left and the left becomes more powerful from the right. And at that split second, when they shift, both are equal. And therefore, they also say that the left breath is connected to one brain and the right breath is connected to the other brain left and right brains. So therefore, Max, even physically speaking, any activity where you require maximum use of your right brain works better when your pingala is on. And any action that requires your left brain to work works best when your ida is on. So the yogi when he's about to do something, decides what he's going to do and changes his breath accordingly. This is possible. There are techniques in yoga by which you can change your breath from the right to the left or the left to the right or make them equal. 
why would the yogi want to make both equal? Because from the point of view of yoga, it's only when both are equal that your prana begins to function on the spiritual realms. Otherwise, it's mostly physical or a little more than that, creative, let's say. But when both are equal, then your prana begins to function through what in yogic terms is called the shushumna, the central channel. So the yogi learns through different practices of pranayama how to shift from left to right or right to left and also how to make them equal. So while he's engaged in some work, immediately if he wants to shut it off and go into a spiritual realm, he just shuts it off using his pranayama and makes both equal and allows the prana to function through the shushumna. The prana that works through the shushumna is called mukhya prana, the most important prana in the human body. Now I'm going to use a word, don't get taken aback. That prana is also called the kundalini. Now why I'm saying don't get taken aback because nowadays this word is bandied about so much. The other day I was reading in a magazine, for 3000 rupees you can raise your kundalini in three hours. I was thinking what kind of fools we have, we worked all our lives to get this done. Mm -hmm. Internet. <laughs> anyway, so uh, this is the connection between prana, pranayama, mind, and that which is beyond the mind, which I said I defined by the word spiritual realms. And you must also remember what I said, that the prana and its grossest level is solid, settler level is so-called liquid level, and so on till it goes to the highest, which is beyond vayu, which is vapor, into akasha, which is undifferentiated matter in the beginning into which the world will go back when it ends and come back again. There is no total end to this. So, the yogi should be able to raise his prana from the gross to the subtle and to the subtle and so on through the Sushumna Nadi, practically speaking, so that his mind expands from the ordinary to that which is extraordinary. This is the science of yoga. The deepest meaning of the word yoga is the human being's capacity to lift himself from the gross to the subtle and subtler and subtler till he finds that ultimately the universal prana and he himself are not different, they are linked all together. And therefore, when he does certain things, people think it's a miracle because he has control over the prana. It's not a miracle. He has learned the scientific rules which we don't know normally or somebody doesn't know. When you see that, there is no mystery out there. And the good news is that everyone has the capacity to do that. There is one, uh, what you call a condition here. That each people are constitutionally different. And therefore, the pace at which one moves may be different, different people. Depends on your effort, depends on your constitution, depends on the right learning. If these three things and supreme interest in what one is doing, if these four points are put together, then I would say, having said that these points exist, everybody has the right to go into it and the capacity to go into it. A yogi might say it may take several lives for some, but then it becomes a control how many lives are there. Let's not go into that. Let's say capacity. So, our discussion on the subject of pranayam today uh, for this class is over at the moment. When we have the next session, I'm going to go into the practicals of how you can manipulate your uh, individual prana, manipulate in the good sense, not in a bad sense, and bring about changes in your system and raise your awareness 
from the gross to the subtle and so on and so forth, so that you yourself know about things that exist rather than hearsay evidence. So, can we now finish this class? Sure, sir. Yeah. You want so, to take a question or? Yes, or... of course, of course. If if, San, if it's okay for our friends to be here on a Sunday for some more time, <laughs> they have other engagements. We can have some question answers. It's my job. I'm not going anywhere. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, Namaste, Guruji. Namaste. Uh, sir, uh, I have a question that uh, it is said in, in religious texts, whatever I've read, that Ida, Pingla, and Shushumna Nadi are related to Goddess Durga or called an instantiation of that. And otherwise, also, such gods are related to our body. So, can you please some, uh, shed some light on this? Right. See, the wonderful thing about our country is that anything that is important and anything that you worship and anything that you venerate is becomes God. <laughs> it's not bad. It's wonderful. Even tomorrow, if you keep a little stone in the middle of the paddy field and worship it, it becomes a shivling. Right? I'm not saying it's bad. So, therefore, this veneration of divinity in anything that you see is part of a system, which is great. And now, when it comes to these energies, the pranas energies, the ida, the left, the pingala, the right. Now, tomorrow I'm going to, when I go to the practical and then I'm going to explain to you how it's connected with your nervous system and your ganglionic chain and so on. Anyway, the question you have asked. When the left is called the the, the cool energy, which is the moon. And the right pingala is the hot energy, which is the sun. So, the deities associated with coolness and the deities associated with fairy expressions are immediately deified in these nadis. And the central nadi, which is the shushumna, the main energy that goes on Shushumna is called Parashakti. Now, why? What is the meaning of Shakti? Energy. Right. And what is Para? Great energy. So, therefore, the energy that moves to the Shushumna is called Parashakti. Now, when that energy works in a very destructive and dangerous form, it's called Bhadrakali. When it works in beautiful ways, like Raja Rajeshwari, Saraswati, Lakshmi, then it becomes a little more friendly energy. Which is in no way saying that the, the primary fairy energy of Kali is bad or good. That's not what I'm talking about. Sometimes without destruction, no creation takes place. So, it may be the double-edged sword might be to finish off what is not good. <laughs> right? So, this is why <coughs> we have this beauty. If you simply say Ida, Pingala, well, it's like some uh, nerves inside the body or channels inside the body. But when I identify it with the deity, then I look at it in a much more sacred way. Which is why we have 22 crores of divine beings in the system. Okay. Thank you, sir. Hi, sir. Uh, good evening. Hello. Yeah. So, uh, I remember our yoga teacher uh, used to tell us uh, that when you breathe through a certain nostril, your body keeps calm. And um, when you change your nostril, then it warms up. Uh, so, leveling that up, I was uh, watching a show uh, where they show that if you uh, breathe in certain techniques or in a certain way, you can draw powers of like five senses. Like uh, you can draw power from fire and water. 
Are they really possible, like you said, Ki? Let me oh. let me explain it in a little different way. Okay, the ida nadi, which is the left and connected to the left nostril, pingala nadi, which is the right, which is sun energy. In fact, the word hatha yoga hatha comes from ha and tha. Uh, ha is sun, fiery energy, hot energy. And Tha is cool energy, which is the moon, associated with the moon. So, when you do particular breathing exercises, what happens is that particular energies in your body are activated. Therefore, the Ida is cool and the Pingala is hot, right? No. If you breathe for a long, for a certain length of time through your left nostril, then you draw cool energies to your system, not only from inside but also from outside. When you use the right, which is the pingala, the body not only gets heated but you also draw heat energy from outside. That, up to that, I can agree. Oh, so like you can't uh, use that powers to say like sword fighting or something. Sword fighting? Yes, you can. You can. Now, now that is a different subject altogether. See, as long as your Ida is functioning most of the time, you cannot really do a sword fight. If you need to do a sword fight, you need fairy energy that comes from the Pingala. So, just before you go out into the Suppose you're going with a sword to f have a sword fight, even if it's for fun, or you're going to do judo or jujitsu or kalari paitu or one of these things, or kung fu, you will see that it works better when your pingala is working, the right nostril, the energy of the sun. So, just before going into the arena, move away for some time and do some deep breathing with your right nostril. Uh, but if your uh, partner who is uh, practicing with you complains that you shot him on the head and all that, don't get upset about it. Because you'll get a lot of energy coming, physical energy. That is possible. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, it is said that when Lord Buddha took enlightenment, he took 108, 108 breaths in a day. So He took how, what? 108? Breaths in a day. I mean, he was able, yes, sir. He was able to take control over his breath. Uh, so, what is, I mean, how was this possible and what is the significance of this 108 number in, even, I mean, in Hindu religion? Let me tell you this. That we really don't know if Buddha took 108 breaths, we don't, nobody measured it. It may be a way of saying it. But what it means is that there is an intimate connection between the Buddha's going into a state of Samadhi, where he realized the truth, and the breathing. This much is established. Whether he actually breathed, we have no record. We don't know if somebody breathed 108 times at that point. We cannot say. But it simply means that there is an intimate link between the number of breaths and the state of mind. And there is no doubt in my mind that Buddha did many yogic practices before he attained illumination. Because today, one of the key teachings of practice which the Buddha has given to us is Vipassana, which means watching the breath. One part of Vipassana is watching the breath which is what most people do. So, watching the breath means what? To be aware of your breathing pattern, to be aware of your breath. When you become aware of your breath, you become aware of your mind. When you become aware of your mind, you begin to see how the mind is influenced by external and internal factors, and then you learn how to free yourself from it. So, there is no doubt in my mind that Buddha was an expert in the practice of breath. There is no question. Uh, you'll see some of his images where he sits and closes his eyes and the ribs are seen. In some of the old pic 
statues you might have seen. Generally, you see a well-fed well Buddha. But in some of those, if you go to some museums, you will see those. That's probably when he's doing kumbhak, holding the breath and releasing. About 108 times, where he. this I can't tell you because we don't know for certain how many times he breathed during that time. But the significance of 108, which you asked me, why is it so significant? This means something. You know, it's not the 108. It is the number 9 that is very important as a symbol in all the Hindu teachings. We have Navaratris, we have now Durgas. Now, 9 is one number which you multiply by any number and you add the total, it will give you 9. 108 is a multiple of 9, right? How many 9s are 108? 12 times. 12 times. 12 times 9 is 108. You add 108. What is the result? 8 plus 1. 9, right. Any number in the world, you multiply with 9 and add the result, it will be 9. So, 9 shows the constant constancy of energy. That energy can neither be created nor destroyed, like Einstein said, is represented by the number 9. Which means it can be small, it can be big, it can, but it remains always the same. This is the significance of 108 and it is a convenient number also. Like when you count do rosaries, 100, add 8, so that it's a multiple of 9. Sir, actually, we talk much about like Guru Goraknath Ji. Yes. That, that the word like Goraknath came from him. So, there are, that is said like the biggest teachings in yoga in India was, were given by him. Like, I, I would like to take this up for discussion in the next class because it is a big subject. I also belong to the Nath Panth. So, I have great importance for Goraknath. So, we will do that separately. It's a big subject altogether. In the next lesson, before I start, first I'll discuss this. Then we'll do the rest. Okay? Uh, Jai Gorak. <laughs> so, Professor, we will now stop for today. Being a Sunday, you should also give me some rest. Sir, sir, <laughs> thank you so much for coming no, on a no, Sunday, sir. No, no, no. So, uh, we'll meet in the next class. Okay, all the best. Take care. And please pick up your sword, huh? Who's going to do that? <laughs> okay, bye.